All right, take your Bible, please. Take your Bible, please, and find 2 Corinthians chapter 2, would you? 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and we're going to read together in just a moment, verse 14 in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And good morning, church family. We're glad to be with you guys again. It's always one of our favorite things to do is come to Cleveland, Ohio, and come to Cleveland Baptist Church. And what a joy to see all of you this morning. How many of you are here? Let me see your hand if you're here this morning. All right, some of you in the balcony aren't here yet, so get here. We're glad, uh, we're glad to be with you guys, and we're looking forward to a great week. Boys and girls, your boys and girls should be looking forward to Brother Chase Williams is with us this week, and he's going to preach to the boys and girls every night starting tonight. He does illusions, and uh, those are great. He's great at that. If you'd like to see one, catch him sometime this week and say, do an illusion for me. And uh, he'll just uh, break one out right there on the spot. He has this really great trick where he makes kids disappear. We haven't found out how to bring them back. So uh, if you have any candidates you'd like to submit there, just let us know. But it's going to be a great week. My sweetheart's here with me, Bethley, and I think most of you know her. We just celebrated 28 years of marriage. And uh, our five young'uns are just growing, growing, growing. And uh, we're so thankful. We did something this fall we haven't done in 24 years. We went on the road a few weeks ago with one child, and uh, it was 24 years ago that Abby came into our life, and uh, she, uh, 25 years ago that Abby came into our life, and we hit the road with her, and then uh, Josh came along, Matthew came along, Jake came along, Charity came along, and then we sent Abby out to college, and she got married, and Josh went to college and got married, Matt went to college and got married, Jake went to college, hopes to get married, and... uh, We're down to charity, so one child. But my goodness, we're glad to be with you guys and looking forward to a great week of revival services. The clock on the back wall says it's 1122. And I understand you guys are always out by two, is that right? (laughs) So we got plenty of time, get comfortable. But to find your Bible, would you please, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and let's look at one verse with one great thought to it. Keep your Bible open, though, because we'll refer to several around it. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. If you have it, say, I got it. All right, the Bible says these words. Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us, in every place. That's just the beginning of the final paragraph in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Let's read that again and let's meditate on that just a moment. The Bible says these words, now thanks be unto God. Stop right there and just marinate on that a moment. Uh, How many of you agree that we have a lot for which to be thankful? How many of y'all agree with that? Hasn't God been good to us? How blessed are you? You got food to eat, nice clothes to wear, Got a lot of nice cars in the parking lot. Uh, We're just blessed, aren't we? But here's a spiritual gratitude. Thanks be unto God, which always, say that word always. Always. All right, now some of you need to get here. All right, come on, you can do better than that. What's that word? The word is? Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. So there's something here to be grateful for. It's a good memory, a good reminder. Praise God for my blessings. Here's something spiritual, though. God always causes us to triumph in Christ. That word triumph is a great word. I like that word. Chew on that just a moment. I like victory, don't you? I like winning. How many of y'all with me on that? How many of y'all like to win? Don't you like to win? Don't you like victory? I'm pro-victory, aren't you? I like that. I like to win. How many of y'all like to win at arguments? Anybody here good at arguing? Anybody here? I like to win an argument, don't you? I, I, I said uh, that somewhere, and somebody sent me a meme, and it said arguing with your wife is like reading software agreements. You have no idea what it's all about, and so it's just good to hit I agree. <laughs> is that true? I don't know. Somebody else sent me one, said the difference in uh, buying a lottery ticket and arguing with your wife is that at least with a lottery ticket, you have a chance of winning. <laughs> but I do like to win, don't you? I'm always pro-victory. I like to win. I like a victory and comebacks. How many of y'all know somebody, and they are really good. They're sharp-witted. Boy, they can come back. They, no matter what you say, they can, they can one-up you. You know somebody like that? And uh, someone sent me a meme about that. It said, uh, this is terrible. It said, maybe you, should, maybe you should eat some makeup so you can be pretty on the inside, too. <laughs> That's a bad comeback right there, isn't it? I just, I like winning. I know you like winning. This is an interesting word in our text. The word is triumph. It's a word that uh, is especially significant 
had you lived in Paul's day. Uh, This is a a Roman word. It was familiar to the Roman culture of Paul's day, and it was a word that would have been used of a conquering commander returning to Rome. Uh, It would have involved a parade. It's quite a word. The parade would uh, have included all kinds of things. There would have been a lot of odors in the parade because the parade route would have been lined with uh, multiple uses of incense, which is why the second half of the verse goes together with the first half. Can you see that idea when he says, thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. What he's saying right here is that God wants me and you to live in victory so that the aroma of Jesus Christ is everywhere that we are. It's an incredible, it's incredible truth. Uh, this uh, parade route, this word triumph, this great general would have gone out and conquered a nation or a village or a city. Uh, the enemy has been defeated, and now he's coming back, not only victorious, but with all the spoils of war. Those whom he has captured and taken captive would have probably led the procession. Uh, there would have been part of the Roman Senate would have been there. This, this is quite a display. Crowds would have lined the streets, and, and history tells us that there would have been one section of all the artifacts that had been captured in the enemy territory. There might have been a golden god there, uh, some statue to some god, some random pagan deity, and, and there would have been all these uh, artifacts and all of these spoils of war. The crowning jewel to the parade, you, you know what I mean by that, don't you? How many of you have been to a Christmas parade, have you? If you've been to a Christmas parade, what's the crowning jewel of the Christmas parade? It's Santa Claus. There he is. We've been to those. There's Santa Claus. Well, in this parade, it would have been the general himself. He would have been seated in a magnificent chariot. History says most frequently it was pulled, it was customary for that chariot to be pulled by white horses. Boy, it was beautiful. This was quite the word, this word triumph. Uh, Several times in history, some of the generals tried to upstage the normal. I I read about Pompey. How many of y'all know that name? Do you recognize that word, Pompey? Pompey, when he returned to Rome victorious, his chariot was led by elephants. Now, that that would have been fairly impressive, I think. I read about Mark Antony. Y'all know that one as well, right? Mark Antony, his chariot, history says, was led by lions. Then there was, I I like this guy, I don't know anything about him, but I just thought his name was cool. There was a general named Heliogobulus. That's quite a name, don't you think? Heliogobulus. Made me stop and think, what were his parents thinking? (laughs) Can you see that story? Hey, honey, what do you think we ought to name our son? You know what? I was thinking Heliogobulus. Y'all with me on that? That's just a weird name, don't you think? If I'd have named my kid that, who knows what I would have called him when I had no idea what his name was. You know what I mean by that, parents? I said to my dog the other night, Charity and I were walking our dog, and I snapped my fingers at my dog, and I said, Charity, get over here. And Charity said, Daddy, that's me. And so I, I don't know what I'd have named my, called my kid if I'd have named him Heliogobulus. Heliogobulus, however, returned to Rome victorious. His chariot was led by tigers. So we had lions and tigers and no bear, oh my. Um, but Pompey had elephants, Mark Antony had, had, had lions, Heliogobulus had tigers, and poor Aurelius, I don't know what he was thinking, but Aurelius, when he returned to Rome, he had his chariot pulled by deer. How many of y'all agree that had to be a disappointment? <laughs> it's like, well, I could have thought of a lot of things to have my chariot pulled by, but deer would not have been one of them, but that's how he did it. This was, uh, this was a great word. It was a very powerful word in Paul's day. And my, my dear brothers and sisters this morning, do, do you realize this is the word God is using to describe you? Now, thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. Catch that word us in there. Causes us to triumph in Christ. Are you aware of the fact, ladies and gentlemen, are you aware of the fact that the plan God has for your life is that you have victory in your life? Is that a, is that a familiar term to you, victory? Is that, is, that how, is that, does that seem pretty normal in your life? You know, I've got love and joy and peace and, and uh, boy, I'm not worried about anything. I'm easy to get along with. I'm sweet-spirited. I'm gentle. Nothing grouchy about me. Nothing bothers me. I just absolutely tell you, victory is the norm of my life. Is that, is that how you're living? 
That's what he says ought to be true in your life. Think of it like this. Look, look at this verse and notice this. Notice that it's assumed. He just says it. Y'all know this term? This is how we'd say it where I grew up in Tennessee. We'd say, uh, that's a done deal. How many of y'all know that term? You know that, that, little, that little term, that little phrase? That's a done deal. Of course that's the way it is. What he says right here is, thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. And he says it like, well, of course that's how it is. It just assumes. It's just an assumption. It's God's plan for your life. Doesn't matter your background. Doesn't matter what's going on, what valley you're in. Doesn't matter what besetting sin you have. Here's, here's what God just assumes about all of us as his people. God's assumption is, of course you have victory in your life. It's assumed. It's a done deal. The second thing I notice in the passage is that there's a little phrase here we got to meditate on. Did you, catch your, you got your Bible open? Now, thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph. Two words out loud. In Christ. Say that again. What's the two words? In Christ. In other words, uh, you, you may have been saved a long time, but you know this, don't you? You still don't have what it takes to have victory on your own. And see, some of you know that by experience. Because you've been saved a long time, but you're down, you're worried, you're frustrated, uh, you're defeated, you're discouraged, you're depressed. Uh, you're uptight, you're grouchy, you're hard to get along with, you're sharp-tongued, you're short-tempered. What do you mean victory? Well, it's not you. It's Christ. It's not something. You say, well, I, I, I just got saved yesterday. The same victory available to somebody that's been saved all their life is available to you because it's not us. It's Christ that does the work in us. You see that idea later in the chapter. You, you got your Bible open? Look, look at the uh, 16th verse. At the end of the 16th verse, he asks a question. He, uh, he describes the victory and what God wants to do through our lives. And then he says this, and who is sufficient for these things? Valid question. Now here's what he says. Who, 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 who can do this? How do you live like that for crying out loud? I mean, it sounds nice that I have absolute triumph in Christ, but how's that possible? Who can do that? You get to chapter 3 and verse 5, and he answers it. Look what he says there. Now, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything is of ourselves, but what? Our sufficiency is of God. See, here's what he's trying to say to you. Church, you can't do it. In this dark world we live in, you can't have victory in your life. You, you can't defeat the forces of hell and the, the battles with the flesh. You can't do it. But there's a God in heaven who has all authority, all power, all strength, all might. And in his son, Jesus Christ, you can have absolute victory. And it's available as certainly as you're in this building this morning. Is that not shouting around? See, here's what he says. It's assumed. Uh, of course, victory's available. It's accomplished in Christ. That's what he's trying to teach us. And then I would, I would just show you something else here. Have you ever thought about this? It's not automatic. Now catch that. Don't miss it. You know, you know, you know, you know why we're going to have a revival this week? Because victory is not automatic. It's, 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 that, it's not like, okay, I got saved. Praise God. I trusted Jesus. I'm going to heaven. And you know what's amazing? I, uh, I've not struggled with sin since then. You know, I got saved, praise God, and everything just fell right in line. My marriage is great, and my kids are great, and my grandkids are great, and I'm just telling you, I'm an amazing man of God. How many of y'all know that's not how it works? Y'all know that's not how it works. Victory is not automatic. Victory is something that I have got to learn how to have in Christ. And that's what we're going to talk about this week, about victory, triumph overcoming in Christ. So three things you got to know this morning, and here they are. Number one, if you're going to have victory in Christ, it's not automatic. So number one, you've got to know your standing. How many of y'all have children? Let me see your hand. You have children? How many of you have children? Did you ever say something like this to your kids? Did you ever say, uh, hey, listen, you remember who you are? Do, do, do you know that phrase? My boys that go off to college, and they're gone. They're going to be on their own out in college. Say, all right, now listen to me, son. You remember who you are. You're a young. That ought to mean something. You live up to the name. You, you remember who you are. You know what's true of us who are saved on our way to heaven? We've got to remember who we are. 
Sometimes we act like, oh my goodness, the world is falling apart, and, and uh, what are we going to do? Can you believe what's happening in the land and in the world and in the government? Oh my, go- oh my goodness, what are we going to do? Have you forgotten who you are? Have, have, you, for- have you forgotten what you have in Christ? I sat down one day, and I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to just off the top of my head write down my standing in Christ. Here's what I came up with. Number one, in Colossians, we are complete in Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 6 says, we are washed, we are sanctified, we are justified. 1 Timothy says, we are set apart for the master's use. 1 Peter says, we are shielded by the power of God and we are kept by the power of God. John chapter 10 says that we are kept in his hand. Jude says we are kept from falling by the power of God. The Bible says we are strengthened by his mighty power in Ephesians 3. We are sealed in heavenly, I'm sorry, seated in heavenly places in Ephesians 2, and we are sealed by the power of his spirit. We are his very own people in Titus 2. We are called, we are greatly loved, we are of his pasture, the people of God. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We are loved with an everlasting love. We are forgiven forever. And in Jesus Christ, we are declared to be absolutely perfect. Now that's shouting God, isn't it? How long has it been since you stopped and thought about who you are? I'm saved. I'm part of the family. I'm a child of God. My sins are washed away. You are looking. This sounds weird, but it's theologically true. Brothers and sisters, you're looking at a perfect man. Now, not literally. You know that, right? But in Christ, I am. My sins are forgiven. I'm washed away. I'm declared righteous through the power of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, I'm not going to heaven because I'm a good man. I'm going to heaven because Jesus Christ's righteousness is placed on my account. And through Jesus Christ, I am a perfect man. Son of Almighty God Himself. Now you just tell me, is that not shouting ground? And some of you have forgotten that, which is why you're defeated. You've been sitting up late watching the news, haven't you? Doesn't that help you to go to bed? Doesn't that help you to go to bed with a happy heart? Isn't that working out good? Lowering your blood pressure? Helping your cholesterol? Aren't you encouraged by the news? You know what? You'd do good to turn it off. You know that, don't you? If you had no idea what was going on in the world, that'd be okay. If you had never heard of Nancy Pelosi, you could die happy. (laughs) If you had no idea even who the name of the president was, if you'd never heard of Donald Trump or a Joe Biden, you could still survive. But you cannot have victory in your life unless you remember who you are through Jesus Christ. Stop this morning. Let's start this revival by saying, God, help me know who I am. I'm your child. I'm forgiven. I'm clean. I'm washed. Say, Dave, you don't know what I do. I don't know what you do, but I know the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. You don't know my past. I don't know your past, but I know your future. If you're a child of God, victory is yours, and it's available simply for you to have if you'll take the right steps. Isn't that incredible? So here's what he says. Look, you want victory in your life? You got to know your standing. Y'all with me on that one? Y'all with me so far? If you don't look like you're getting this, I'll keep preaching. We'll be here till three o'clock, people. So at least, at least let me know somehow. Are you with me this morning? You're, you're, you got to know your standing. And here's the second thing. You got to settle your salvation. You can't have victory in Christ until you know Jesus Christ is your Savior. You can't have triumph in this world until you're born again through the power of Jesus Christ. Listen to these verses. I, I love these verses. Uh, 1 John chapter 5. You want to turn there with me? 1 John chapter 5, and when you found it, look at verse 11, and we'll read three verses. 1 John chapter 5, verse 11. All right, I'll give you a moment to get there. In my Bible, that's page 1,458. And if you don't have my Bible, good luck. If you find concordance, you've gone too far. So locate the book of 1 John chapter 5, verse 11. If you got it, say amen. Amen. All right, many of you do, so let's start reading. The Bible says these words, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his church. Nope. This life is in baptism. No, no. This life is in being a good husband. No, what's it in? Who's the son of God? 
All right? So here's what the Bible says. God gave us a record so that we can have eternal life, and this eternal life is available through who? Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So then he says in verse 12, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Three things I learned in this passage, and here they are. Number one is, look, 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 look. Here's number one. We have a record. This is the record. See, how, how, how do I know about God? Because God gave you a record so you could know. How can I know what happens after you die? God gave you a record so you can know. How do I know who's right and who's wrong? After all, there's a lot of opinions. Is that, is that right or wrong? Knock on 10 doors in Brooklyn, Ohio. Knock on 10 doors and ask this question at 10 different doors. How do you get to heaven from Brooklyn, Ohio? You knock on 10 doors, ask that question. How many of y'all know you'll get 12 different answers? Is that right? See, well, there's a ton of churches, and one church says this, and one church says that, and one religious leader says this. Who's right and who's wrong, and how do you know? God says, you know, I knew you were going to have that problem, so let me help you with that. I've given you a record. I've given you my word. You can go to my word. My word will tell you what you need to know about me and what you need to know about you and, and how you can be forgiven of all of your sins and how you can have everlasting life. God has given us a record. And how many of y'all know and how many of y'all believe? This is no ordinary book. Y'all believe that, don't you? It's true. It was written over 1,500 years by 40 different writers in three different languages. And yet, put it all together, and it's one book with one story, with one theme. How many of y'all agree? That's a miracle. Why, well, if 40 of us sat down this morning and wrote a history or uh, a poem or, or told a story or made a prediction about the future, and we put it all together, it would be the biggest messed up story you've ever read in your life. There's no way that can happen. But it can if Almighty God is doing a miracle and telling men and ladies exactly what to write down so that in their 1,500 years of writing, they were writing his words so we would know his record, so we could know how to be born again, children of God, and on our way to heaven. We have a record, and this is no ordinary book. It's worth your considering. Are you all with me? So we have a record. The second thing we have is we have a Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. We have a record and we have a Savior. And here's what he says. This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. Now watch this. Don't miss the simplicity of that statement. I can't give you eternal life. I'm going to say this gently. Virgin Mary can't give to you eternal life. A pope can't give to you eternal life. Pastor Folger can't give to you eternal life. Mom and dad cannot give to you eternal life. That's something God has to do. God is the one that gives eternal life. And how does God do that? The Bible says right here, this life is in his son in such a way that he that hath the son hath life, and he that hath not the son of God hath not life. Who's the son of God? Say it out loud. His name is? His name is Jesus, Jesus Christ. Now, why is he so important? Look at me. I'm almost done. You know why Jesus Christ is so important? Because Jesus Christ is the God of the universe who 2,000 years ago stepped out of eternity into human time and became a baby. God says that the world is falling apart and under my condemnation and on the road to hell, and yet I love them. They've shaken their fist at me. They've turned their back on me, and yet I love them. And they're without hope. They cannot save themselves from sin and hell. They, they need help. And so God says, then I'll come into the world and live among them. And the Bible says things like this. The Bible says that Jesus was tempted in all points just like you and me just like you and I are. He's tempted in all points, just like you and I. And yet the Bible says, you know this church? And yet, without sin. Nobody else can say that. You can't say that. I can't say that. 
the Pope can't say that. The Virgin Mary can't say that. But Jesus Christ can. He was the God-man without sin. And you know what he did? He went to a cross 2,000 years ago and died for our sins. Isaiah, one of the Bible writers, says it like this. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was on him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. You know what the Bible's trying to tell you? Jesus did something for you that nobody else can do for you. Jesus did something for you that you cannot do for yourself. He died, paid your sin debt, was buried. He really died. He was buried. And he was raised from the dead. Jesus is alive. He was raised from the dead. Jesus changes lives. You know how we know? Because many of us have experienced it. We were sinners. We were on the road to hell. We didn't know God. We weren't part of God's family. But we met Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, the living God, the risen Savior, changed our lives by his own power. He wants to do that for you. He's the Savior of the world. He, he, God gave us a record and God gave us a Savior. And so then here, okay, here's the question. If, if God gave a Savior so that I could be forgiven and have victory in my life, well, then how does that happen? And it's so simple, it's almost startling. Here's what he says in the text. Verse 13, these things are written unto you that, here's the word, believe on the name of the Son of God, you that believe on the name of the Son of God. Now, it's a bigger word than perhaps you might think, but it's still a simple word. Here's the idea. The word believe means to trust, to rely on, to depend on. It's this idea, well, here I am, a sinner, and, and, and I know I sin, and everybody knows I sin, and we all know that we sin. And according to God's record, I'm separated from him because of sin, and, and, and I have no hope of going to heaven because of my sin. But God loves me according to the record, and Jesus died for my sins, and he was buried, and he was raised from the dead to prove that he really died for my sin, and, and that his offer of eternal life is valid. He proved it by raising from the dead. And so, as a sinner, here's what the Bible says, if I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he'll take away my sins and save me. If I depend on the Lord Jesus Christ, he'll take away my sins and save me. If I rely on what Jesus did, I can have forgiveness of sins and everlasting life. It really is that simple. I, I, I like there, there are two things I did that, that, that helped me to be saved. And here's the first one. I humbled myself. Have you ever humbled yourself? Have you ever said, God, I, I just want to tell you something, God. You're right about me. Okay, God, I admit it. I'm a sinner, and I, I, I can't get to heaven. I don't even know where it is, and, and I don't know how to get there. And, okay, God, you're right. I'm a sinner. Has there ever been a time in your life when you humbled yourself? God, you're right. I don't deserve to be saved, and I don't even know how to be saved, and I don't, I'm not part of your family. I don't even know what that means necessarily. God, I, I need help. I confess I'm a sinner, and you know it, and I know it, and, and I'm a lot worse even than I think I am, according to your word, and God, I don't know what to do. I need help. It starts with humility. No, that's not enough. Like, I've met folks before that say, I know, I know I'm a sinner. Uh, I'm not interested in that saved thing. You can humble yourself and admit you're a sinner and still not be part of the family of God. It's not enough, but it is a beginning. God, you're right, I'm wrong, help. You got this idea of humility? So I humbled myself, and the second thing I did is I said, okay, God, you said that your son Jesus died for my sins and was buried and was raised from the dead, and that through him I could be forgiven and have eternal life. So, God, I believe on Jesus. God, I'm trusting in Jesus. God, I'm relying on Jesus to be my God and my Savior. Taking you at your word, God, I'm a sinner on the road to hell, can't save myself, but I'm believing in Jesus that he'll forgive my sins and save me. You follow what John's saying in this passage? Are you, a, are you, are you born again through Jesus? 
The Bible says it in several ways, not, not so we can have theological discussions in our seminaries, but so we can all wrap our mind around it in a way we understand it. So he said, Dave, I don't know that I know what, it, I don't know if I understand that word believe. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I'm not sure I understand that. All right, then John will say it like this. But to as many as received him, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So I don't know if I understand that word believe. Okay, then receive him. So I don't even know what, I don't even know what that means. All right, then try this one. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, I don't, know if I, I don't know if I get that word believe. I'm not sure I can wrap my mind around that. All right, then try the word receive. To as many as received him. I don't know if I get that either. All right, then do this. Call on him. You, you got that one, don't you? Okay, God, help. I'm a sinner. I'm going to hell. I need a savior. Will you forgive my sins and save me? What's God doing in saying it in so many ways? He's trying to give all of us a handle we can grab onto so we can understand how much he loves us so we can be forgiven of our sins and have everlasting life. See, I don't even know if I understand those. Try this one. On the day of Pentecost, when the church was being born there in Jerusalem, and, and a lot was happening that day, and God's power had fallen in, in Jerusalem, here, here's, here's, here's what they said, what, what have we got to do to be saved? And they said, repent. See, well, I don't know about that word believe, and I don't know about that word receive, and I'm not even sure I understand the word call. All right, then just fall on your face and say, God, I'm a sorry sinner, and I know I'm a sorry sinner, and I don't want to be a sorry sinner. I want Jesus Christ to save me from sin and hell. I don't know which one you've got to have, but I do want to tell you who you've got to have. You've got to have Jesus Christ wash away your sins and give you everlasting life, or you cannot be on your way to heaven, and you will never know the victory that's in Jesus Christ. See, oh, we're, we're, all, we're all different stages. My wife got saved when she was four. Her daddy's a pastor, and he got ready every Sunday morning for church, singing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, and and dad, I said in the first service, Bethley's dad always preached the gospel. I heard him preach to a group of preachers one time in a pastor's fellowship, and he gave the gospel. And I thought, well, maybe one of those preachers needs to get saved. Who knows? But that was just Bethley's dad. That's just how he was. He always just gave the gospel. If you went to the store with him, he'd say to somebody as they're taking his money, you know, or running his credit card, he'd say, hey, let me ask you a question. He'd talk about Jesus. God. So Bethlehem got saved when she was four. No surprise there. She knew the gospel, and she needed to be saved just as much as anybody else. She was four. I was 15 when I got saved. I was a teenager, and I heard about the gospel. I humbled myself, called on Christ, believed on Christ, received Christ, repented. I changed my mind, and I turned to Christ. And I'm just telling you, I got saved. I was 15. My dad was in his 20s when he got saved. My papa was in his 60s when he got saved. And my grandfather was 92 when he got saved. I'm just telling you, you need to be saved. The Bible says, thanks be unto God which always, who always causes us to triumph in Christ. Listen to me. You, you've got to know your standing, brothers and sisters, but you've also got to settle your salvation. And I'll close with one more thing. Can you handle one more? All right. It's only 1154. You can handle one more, can't you? You've got you to gotta, you gotta take some steps. Victory's not automatic, so know your standing. How long has it been since you knew who you are? You're in Christ. You're forgiven. You're clean. You're filled with the Spirit of God. You're part of the family. You're in the palm of Jesus Christ's hand. I'm telling you, that is shouting ground. And some of you look like you could use some of that. You've got to know your standing. You've got to settle your salvation. And I'm just here to tell you this morning, you've got to take some steps. Victory's not automatic. It might be that you've been saved and you're born again and you've not yet been baptized. All right, it's time. It's time you make that known. I need to get baptized and you need to make that known to the church so that the church can talk to you about it and explain it to you and help you to understand that you need to be baptized. You need to follow Jesus Christ. You need to identify with his church. You, you need to publicly testify, I am saved, and my baptism is evidencing that I'm identifying with Christ and his church, and I want it be known that I believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why we baptize by immersion. 
It pictures the death of Christ, buried with him by baptism and risen to walk in newness of life. It pictures his death and it pictures his resurrection. Maybe the step in your life is you need to get baptized. It might be it's time for you to join the church. Everybody ought to be part of the church. That's more than attending. That's, that's belonging. That's participating. That's identifying. That's that's serving, that's ministering. We ought to, maybe the step for you is baptism. Maybe the step for you is church membership. You know what I'm going to do every night this week? I'm going to preach every night this week about what's your step. God wants you to have victory, and it's not automatic. And you know what? Some of us need to stop and examine our life and say, okay, God, what is it in my life where I need to take another step? You know what I've discovered? I... Uh, I've been saved 36 years now. I'm 51, if you're wondering. I catch us people off guard when I say that because I look so young. Um, but these 36 years I've been saved, all 36 years when I've taken the time to say this to God. Uh, hey, hey, God, this is Dave here, and I just thought I'd spend a little time with you. And Anything in my life I need to change, improve, correct, Add, do differently. Every single time that I've gone to God like that, okay, God, what is it in my life? This is the weirdest thing. The Lord always has something in mind. He'll say, well, you know what? How about that right there? Let's work on that now. Anybody here been saved so long that you're as perfect as it's possible to be? Nobody stood. That's probably a good sign, isn't it? Because that would have been really weird. Hey, Brother Young, I'm in. I just, I don't know if I can go any further. I just, I'm right up there next to Jesus now, I'm telling you. Well, no. It's not possible. So what are you going to do in this revival? Well, I hope you'll come, and I hope you'll enjoy the services, and I hope you'll sing with all your heart, and I hope you'll fellowship, and, and uh, grab a cup of coffee afterwards at the coffee shop, and Bring your kids so they can enjoy Brother Chase, and I hope you'll do all of that. But, but you know what I really hope you'll do? Is you'll say, okay, God, I want victory in my life in another area. Help me out here. Lord, what do I, what, what, God, talk to me. What do I need to work on? You know what you do? You talk to God like that. He's going to give you the next step. So, oh, come on, Brother Young. I've been saved for years. Well, God bless you, and God love your heart. But I have a feeling if you talk to God about it, there's probably an area or two where you could do better. That's what revivals all of us. That's why we're having these meetings. Because I want more victory. How many of y'all like to win? How many of y'all like to win? Are y'all women? Do you like to win? I want to be a winner, don't you? I want to have triumph in my life. Say, Dave, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what my background is. You don't know what my besetting sin is. I don't. But you can have victory because this is God's plan for your life. Now, thanks be unto God, which always. What's the word? Now, thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to what? Triumph in Christ. That's God's plan for you. So how are you doing this morning? It's Sunday morning, and here you are, where you always are, many of you. How are you doing? Do you know your standing? Here's what we ought to do in this invitation. Here's what we ought to do. Number one, many of us ought to pray. Maybe it's been years since you walked down an aisle and made an altar at these steps or at these front seats. Maybe you don't remember the last time you knelt at your pew. might be good for us this morning to make an altar in this Sunday morning service and say, God, I am overwhelmingly grateful for what you've done in my life. God, I have victory, and I'm amazed by that. You've been so good to me. God, I'm free, I'm clean, I'm forgiven, I'm saved, I'm, I'm, I have your spirit, I'm, I'm justified, I'm washed, I'm delivered, I'm not what I was. I've been changed, I've been newborn, all my life has been rearranged. What a difference it made since Jesus came and stayed. Oh yes, I've been changed. You ought to praise God for that this morning. Number two, somebody here ought to be saved this morning. Jesus is the Savior, and he loves you. 
He's already made available how you can be forgiven of all of your sins through Jesus Christ. And if you turn to Christ, believe on Christ. Say, Dave, I don't know exactly what to do. In a moment, we'll go to prayer. And when we do, just pray at your seat. Just pray at your, step out in the aisle if you want to and kneel. Just kneel right by your seat and say, God, I admit it. I'm a sinner and I don't want to go to hell and I want to know you and I want to be forgiven. That, do it there at your seat and come down the aisle and tell us and we'll pray with you. We'll have counselors here at the front and greeters here at the front to pray with you, to encourage you, to love on you, to help you, to answer your questions. Get saved there at your seat and come tell us and we'll pray with you about it. So I don't know what to do. Then walk down the aisle this morning during the prayer time and meet one of the greeters and say, I want Jesus Christ to be my God and my Savior. You know what we'll do? We'll do everything we can. We'll do everything in our power to take you to the Bible to help you understand more fully so you can leave this building this Sunday on your way to heaven, a child of God, forgiven of your sins. You can walk out of here with all of that absolutely true in your life. That's the second thing you ought to do. Number one, you ought to, you ought to just praise God with thanksgiving. That's what he says in the verse. Number two, you just ought to, you ought to get saved if you don't know Jesus Christ. And number three, you ought to take another step. Just take another step. Join the church. Come on and tell them you want to join. Baptism, talk to them about it. Maybe there's a step I haven't mentioned, but you know because God's talking. Then kneel and pray about it, and let's just get started right away having revival. Let's just jump in right away. All right, Sunday morning, I'm just going to start right off. I'm already on the winning side. I'm already getting renewed victory. That's God's plan for you. Have I made sense? Y'all with me there in the balcony? All well? You, may, you got it? Have I made sense? All right, then let's stand together.